evening, everyone. Welcome. Good to see everybody. Did you guys come uh, for the ice cream? Um, all right, so welcome to the last in a series of panel discussions about women, the media, and the workplace. I'm Julia Wallace, the Frank Russell Chair here at Cronkite and a longtime newspaper editor and media exec. I've really enjoyed moderating these panels, and I will be sorry when they end. I know some of you have been here one, two, or three other sessions. Thank you for your dedication. And also thanks to the Facebook Live audience who is joining us tonight. Um, after the session, we will have a networking opportunity with ice cream and conversation. The panelists based here in Phoenix have agreed to stay around and answer any questions you might have. And remember, the hashtag for this is Women Workplace, and I hope you'll tweet out key moments. Uh, tonight, the discussion will be a little different than previous sessions. We're opening the lens a little more broadly than to just sexual harassment. Tonight, we want to talk generally about how women can succeed in the workplace. One note, of course, many of these lessons apply to men as well. What you'll hear tonight is just plain good career advice. Um, so let me begin and introduce the first person who will be joining us via the big screen. I want to introduce Rashida Jones. Um, is she there, Chris? Hey, Rashida. Um, she is the Senior VP for Specials at NBC and MSNBC. She joined MSNBC in 2013 as an executive producer and has quickly moved through the ranks. Quickly, in fact, is a slow word to describe Rashida's ascension. She is one of the top women in broadcast TV. And so I couldn't think of anyone better to have join us tonight to tell us what your secrets are and how you were able to do what you've done in such a short period of time. Thank you. Happy to be here remotely. OK, so Rashida, if you could just start out and talk a little bit about you know, your first job and how you sort of got from your first job to where you are, that would be great. Sure. So I got my first job actually not far from the seats that many of you guys are in. I was in college. I was in a uh, producing class where my teacher suggested we do what she called practice interviews at her station. She was a main anchor uh, at one of the local affiliates. And so the day of my practice interview, we had a guest speaker who was the 11 o'clock producer for her station. Um, I latched on to her because I wanted to be a producer. That was my long, lifelong dream to be a producer. And so I just look at my writing. Can you please tell me all, all of your tricks? How does this work? By the time I bugged her enough during our class presentation, when I got to the station for my, quote, practice interview, the guy in the interview told me, we can't hire you. Um, we can't even do the interview because the newsroom wants to hire you right now. So that's actually how I got my first job. Just who had no idea that I was essentially auditioning for a job that I didn't know existed, um, and I started as an associate producer at that uh, CBS affiliate in Norfolk, Virginia. So I, so I started there, um, loved everything about it, the overnights, the no sleep, the breaking news, the flying by the seat of your pants, um, but then felt like I wanted to do something a little different, live somewhere different, have a different experience. Left there, went to the Weather Channel, kind of the same idea. Uh, we had just had a hurricane in our area, and I thought, oh, this was kind of cool to cover. What if I just did this all the time? So I went to the Weather Channel, kind of as the backup weekend producer. Again, moved up the ranks um, pretty quickly to produce, and then uh, executive produce there. I la launched a couple shows there, including um, Al Roker's show on the Weather Channel, which just went off the air, I think, last year. Um, same, same deal after a couple of years, moved up. Uh, eventually into a role that they created for me, which was director of live programming. So it was take all of the workflows and high energy and production value that I created for one show and just do it for the entire network. And so after seven years there, um, where I really learned how to be a leader, I learned how to be a manager, I learned how to cover breaking news, um, I wanted to get back into more traditional news. And so left that, left that great station, great, great team to become a news director. So in South Carolina, in Columbia, South Carolina, I took on the role as a news director for the NBC affiliate in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, loved it there. I thought this is a great place to learn and grow and really develop how to run a newsroom. 
after a couple of years, NBC came knocking on the door. It was an NBC affiliate and said, we see what you're doing down here. We want you to come up to the network and bring that same sensibility. And so I've been at the network for now a little over five years. Um, started as an executive producer for one show. Really, this I've got the same playbook. It was come do this one show. We like what you're doing with this show. Just do it for the entire day part. Um, and I, I ran dayside programming for a few years. And then about a year ago, I uh, was asked to take over special programming, which is everything from breaking news. I was in a control room today, I don't know, maybe six hours between Zuckerberg and Mueller stuff and Syria and all this other jazz. So we cover breaking news and then also big events like the royal wedding. Those are the two big things on my plate right now. But that's, that's kind of how my path went. So what do you think, if you had to list two or three attributes that have sort of contributed to make, allowing you to get where you are, what would they say? What, what has sort of made the difference for you? Because there are a lot of people who start in local TV and never end up where you are. Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, for, first and foremost it would be just being a go-getter. I was always someone who wanted new experiences, new opportunities. I was always the first person to raise my hand. It didn't matter that I came in at 10.30 the night before and in the 9 a.m. meeting, the news director may have said, hey, we need someone who can work on this. I would be the first person to raise my hand and say, I will work on this and it's due at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So, so that, I think, was key for me. And then the other thing was um, just always being – creating value around myself as far as being the go-to person for what other people didn't want to do. And what I think, and those, those two things go hand in hand, but what I think they did is there, most, most of my opportunities came up for experiences that I didn't know existed. There were jobs that I didn't know existed. They, you know, as I said, at the Weather Channel, they created that role to run all of the live programming. Um, I didn't know NBC Network was looking at me when I was being a news director. So raising your hand enough, kind of being that person who takes the initiative, but also not being afraid. I would say if, that, if I had to pick a third thing is I was, I would say over the course of my career, pretty fearless. Um, I never felt like I was in a room that I wasn't supposed to be in or that others who worked with me or around me um, were there because they were talented and I wasn't. And so I think just that kind of innate confidence also helped me to take chances and go for things that perhaps if I were a little more reserved or shyer or unsure of myself that I would never go for. And do you think that being a woman has been an advantage or disadvantage for you? I think, you know, I haven't had a lot of instances where it's been a disadvantage. I don't know that it's necessarily opened a door that wouldn't have otherwise been opened. Um, frankly, for me, especially earlier in my career, the biggest hurdle that people had to get over because I you know it wasn't my hurdle to get over it was other people's was my age as I said I started really early I started um, working professionally my junior year in college I worked overnights and then went to class during the day and so my peers saw me as you know this young not even legal you know we would we would go to happy hour after work and I would have to wait outside until after happy hour because I was not 21 um, and so I, I, I think that just, if anything, it probably shadowed any other bias that other people had, and, and you know, I grew out of it as time went on. But I, I think, I, you know, I was lucky enough to either find or connect with other women in s either similar roles or roles that I aspired to. You know, m most of my mentors now are, just by coincidence, women in leadership. And so I think just, you know, the fact that I had people in those types of roles to look up to, it wasn't, um, it made it easier being going through those transitions because I'm, for the most part, as a woman, I wasn't the first to do it. There were other women in leadership roles and, and I was lucky enough to have them kind of help make the landing a little easier. So are there things that you think that women have to be particularly attentive to as they try to sort of move up in or an organization, media organizations? I think the biggest thing is being sure of yourself. As I said before, that a lot of times if you project um, insecurity, other people will, will pick that up. And I think for, for me personally, one of the things that has made it easier to get beyond that is I've always been confident in my ability to either take on a task, figure it out, learn how to do it. And I think as, as has been talked about in other forms, women sometimes are not comfortable being outwardly confident in that way. And I think 
that, you know, if you believe it and if you truly feel it and believe it and project it, it makes it so much harder for other people to put those barriers on me. And, and one, of, one of my tactics kind of in that space has always been, you can doubt me because I'm a woman, because I'm young, because I'm African American, at times with accent, but you can't deny what I deliver. And as long as I keep delivering and as long as I keep performing, that will speak for itself. Great, thank you very much. Um, so let me move on to our next panelist. Um, so Karen Bordelow is a, the retired senior vice president and executive director of the Providence Journal. And she's here this semester as the visiting professor of ethics. Um, and so Karen, one of the questions I have for you is you worked your way up at the, at the journal. What tips do you have for women to succeed in media? I'm glad you asked that question. It, um, but uh, Rashida actually has a lot of um, um, some very good advice as well. Um, so I have uh, I have it sort of divided um, um, into uh, step one, which are the easy fixes. Step two, which is sort of in the middle there, and step three, which is really for management. But step one, the easy fixes. The first thing is, I need you to stop ending declarative sentences in a question? Because I find that women do this on a regular basis, and, and it is not showing any confidence at all. Um, so, uh, so you tell me if you were the executive editor of the Providence Journal and somebody came in to pitch something to you and said, um, Karen, um, I'm thinking that maybe we should add $20,000 to the social media training budget. Um, if you think that's a good idea, I don't really know, but if you think it's a good idea, or Karen, I think we should add $20,000 to the social media budget because the New York Times, um, it's 1% of their budget that they do and $20,000 is 1% of our budget. And I actually did some research and, and here are some of the companies that can help us uh, you know, accomplish our goals there. Well, I'm kind of about it now, right? So, so please. Stop with the questions. Um, the second easy fix for you is using more assertive body language. You just have to do it. You have to. You have to stand up straight. Um, when you are slumped down like this on a regular basis, what you're saying is, um, I'm volunteering to do like the dress down Friday pizza parties and not the big education projects. I mean, so what do you want to do? You kind of have to like project, and Rashida was saying that. You project passion. I know we all feel it if we're journalists, men and women, but you need to project it. You know, you need to show excitement. Um, so now we're getting going here, and uh, step two to me is when you're pitching a story, be succinct. Um, and I know this sounds like a stereotype, but it's been my experience a little more. Um, when women are pitching a story, they tend to roll around in the pitch, and it takes a long time. And if you're the executive editor, or you, and you have little time, because you're already working a 12-hour day, um, I need you to be straight. Like, you tell me what your lead is because I can ask for more information. I say, send me a link, um, but, but don't roll around in the pitch for like days <laughs> because we tend to do that. Um, another thing I'm getting going is, and Rashida also um, alluded to this, is ask for the big assignments. You need to get out of your comfort zone. It's so easy for us to take the same old, same old, you know, because we know like what the expectation is, we know how we're gonna do it, but, um, but, but move beyond that. I mean, do something different, do something extra, um, because that's gonna get you noticed. Um, and then, <clears throat> this is, uh, this is very important for you. Find a mentor or two or three. And it doesn't matter if they're men or women. You know, a combination of both would be terrific. I've had both men and women, and the men have actually been married to very strong women, so it worked out just great. Um, but they open doors for you. Um, and the other thing is, it's a two-way relationship, so you're going to show them things that were published. You're going to tell them about your successes, and you're going to appreciate them for helping you get to those successes. Um, 
a couple of more things is um, take your rightful place at the table. I've seen so many times when women come into a conference room and you belong there. So I don't want you sitting like on the side against the wall. You need to sit at that table. You, when, when it's something that you're involved in, there's a, you're working on a special project with four or five other journalists and there are many editors at that table. You get there early, you sit at that table. Um, you, that helps get you noticed, but also not just sit there, be quiet, but you will have done the research. You will know the answer. You will know how to pitch it. Um, so I just think um, that you, like I just really love it when journalists, whether they're male or female, come in with a new idea um, and they're excited about innovating because that's kind of where we have to go. Um, and when you start talking about ideas for innovation, that really gets our attention. Um, and then I think for managers, a um, couple of things. One is that women really have to be more careful. Um, I'm afraid to tell you it's a, it's a dichotomy, but we have to be careful when showing anger or frustration. It has to be very rational because with men it's assertive, and it, that is true, at least in my experience. And with women, we are just itchy, let's just say. That's what we're, not. it's itchy. Hmm? Hysterical. Hysterical, itchy, you know, it's that time of month. You know, how old, do I, how old am I? Okay. Um, so, so I would say that be careful about that. And then um, also be a sister. Um, it is not enough for you when you're climbing the ladder of success um, to, to just go up it yourself. You have to always have one hand on this rung, and the other one, you're pulling someone up um, with, with the other hand. Um, and, and I like to see sisters pull up sisters. Not to say that I haven't pulled up a lot of men in my life, because I have, and they've pulled me up too. But, but it isn't just about one woman getting to the top. Um, and when you are at the top, uh, I think one of the things that we forget is um, there is a, as soon as you hear that glass ceiling breaking and the tinkling of glass, it's just the beginning. You have a lot of eyes on you if you're a woman, way more than a man does, um, because in my case, I was the first uh, female executive editor of the Providence Journal in the 189 year history of that paper. So I had not just making sure that that brand was protected and the journals were doing their, their thing. But I had to make sure, double make sure, that every decision I made was the right one because I was being watched more carefully than a male counterpart. So th those are some of my suggestions. That's great advice. All right, let's keep going. More advice. This is all about advice tonight. So Jennifer Kaplan is the owner and CEO of Evolve PR and Marketing. And their client list is literally a who's who of Phoenix. Um, so Jennifer, you've, you've built a great company. Uh, talk a little bit about what tips you have for, for women, and particularly in the PR area. Well, I think you're going to see a theme here, <laughs> uh, taking aspects of Rashida. No shrinking violets in the group? Yeah. Pardon me? No shrinking violets <laughs> in the group? No. No, so you're going to definitely hear a theme here and echo a lot of what you've been hearing. Um, so I want to start out by sharing a quote from, um, I practiced her name too, Ianla Van Zandt, the way to achieve your own success is to be willing to help someone else get it first. So bringing people up the ladder with you. As the owner of one of the largest PR firms in town, I talk to students and individuals all the time wanting to get into PR. I think the best way to learn the most as you begin your career is to work in an agency environment first. There are a lot of great jobs working in-house and at a company or business. However, I feel you'll get a broader range of experience and exposure to the world of PR at an agency. Since we're focusing on women in the PR world, from my experience, most of the agencies here in town are owned or run by women. I can only speak from being in Arizona, however, I would guess that to be pretty true in most cities until you get to large full service agencies where men are running most of them, and we were talking about that earlier. You will also see if you work outside of an agency in the corporate world, in-house somewhere, that there are mostly men at the highest levels. I feel you can use that to your advantage by working first in an agency environment, women supporting women. We have about 12 people in our office, and only one is a male. 
but it's not because I discriminate against hiring males. We just don't get a lot of uh, resumes. However, that male also does social media. He doesn't even do PR in our office. Some of you may already have a job when you graduate, and some of you are still in school and deciding which direction you want to take. I suggest internships and getting as much experience as you can. If you don't have a job or can't find a job when you graduate, do something in the PR and communications world. That was one of the best pieces of advice someone gave me when I graduated. Don't let time lapse if you don't have to and show that you're wanting to work and not just waiting. Show that you're working on your skills and thriving as you interview. I feel it makes you more valuable to a potential um, employer. I know we are in a very interesting time with the Me Too movement and the place that women are taking in the world. Hopefully all of those strides will help you in the years to come. Feel your power and never let anyone hold you back from pursuing your dreams and desires. Embrace who you are and allow the best you to shine. Being a woman in any business and being a successful woman in any business is all about feeling your power, owning it, and embracing it, which again is what Rashida was saying too. I also, like Rashida said, haven't found myself in a situation where I, being a woman, played a role for or against me as I've been growing my firm. However, I have observed women playing certain roles to manipulate a situation, and my advice is to never do that. Um, my guess is that Rashida hasn't done that and probably why we are at where we're at. Um, it's leading with our but knowledge. I've seen it. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's leading with yeah. our knowledge, with our expertise, with our experience, um, with our contacts, with our network, and not other assets or um, you know fallbacks um, or excuses. So this is a delicate conversation and yet an important conversation. I feel that I've been fortunate in this area because I don't use my femininity to earn the respect and business from clients. I make myself relatable to them and I earn their respect. I don't portray myself as weak or meek um, as a female that automatically creates a perception of a role that a lot of women do fall into. Um, I kind of drew an example here. There is a individual peer of mine in town that other people do tend to refer to because she uses social media to talk a lot about guys and men and dating. And, you know, this obviously is going to make people think something of her, whether it's true or not, and therefore it's going to translate into the relationships that she has in business. So this would be my big thing to embed in your brain forever, and I'm sure you've heard it before, perception is reality. So if you want to be perceived a certain way by anyone, especially men, never allow yourself to fall into that role of weakness. So, you know, that's, that would be my biggest thing and that kind of echoes what I was saying. Because we're on the agency side, we have multiple clients we deal with and to be honest with you, most of our contacts within those clients are men. Since they are paying us to provide a service, there's a fine line I feel you always need to take of not putting yourself in a situation that's uncomfortable. No dollar amount is worth the position me or myself or my staff could find ourselves in. It may sound silly, but as a single person, I've never dated or gone on a date with a client. Um, I prefer to do meetings that are during work hours. Um, when I get to know my clients, I ask about their wives or their families. Um, you have that ability to position yourself in a manner that sends a message of what you would allow and not allow. So feel your strength. I could talk on this topic for hours. Um, there are many other ways as a woman you can achieve tremendous success and position yourself as smart, dynamic, and capable without having a man make you feel otherwise. Um, the way you dress, the way you speak, nonverbal communication, where you sit at the conference table, uh, where and how you talk about your personal life, and more, all affect that. So just remember that you can control all of those things. So I'm going to close with one more quote, and this one's from Melinda Gates. Uh, a woman with a voice is, by definition, a strong woman. Great. Thank All you. All right. Now let's, we're going to turn to the gurus. Kristen Gilger, Senior Associate Dean here at Cronkite and longtime newspaper editor, and Mike Wong, Director of Career Services at Cronkite. 
You both have seen a lot of Cronkite students graduate and move out and head into the real world. What are the qualities that make them successful, do you think, specifically the women? You want to start? Either one. Okay. Is this working? Hi. Uh, first of all, I'm too short for the chair, so I have to sit up in order to reach the floor. Um, I wanted to, I, I think there's, there's pretty universal agreement about what, what leadership characteristics um, get you to the top. And the first and most important one is competence. I mean, you have to have the skills, you have to be good at your job. Um, the second most important thing is the ability to communicate and to communicate with empathy. And I think in the sort of a big third category are things like, you know, courage and, and, uh, and willingness to take risks um, and innovate. And if you think about it, um, women actually sort of have an advantage in some of these areas. Um, I don't know about you, but if I get on an airplane and there's a female airline pilot, I think, wow, she must be really good <laughs> to have gotten that job. I feel really safe here. Um, and and I, I, people do get promoted, people do, in my experience, get promoted even though they're not competent. I have rarely found that to be the case with a woman. Um, so I don't think competence is usually an issue. Women are generally pretty good communicators and maybe empathetic to a fault. Uh, maybe too good of communicators and a little too empathetic sometimes. But you know that's an area where women, you know, maybe have a bit of an advantage, right? And then on the sort of courage and risk taking part of it. Um, I think one way to look at that is because women are often sort of outsiders to an organization that uh, you can look at things differently. You can see the workplace or the work product a little bit differently and come in with some you know, new and interesting ideas of you know, how things ought to be done. So uh, with all of that, then why aren't there more women in top positions? So I want to talk about that a little bit. I actually have a few statistics for you. So, um, The number of women leading media organizations is dropping. It's not going up, it's dropping. Um, Julie and I are working on a book on women leaders in news, and I've been startled uh, at the numbers. Um, they were, we were doing better 10, 15 years ago. And in the last decade or so, the number of women leaders in news has uh, drop quite substantially. Um, the number of CEOs and women in politics, um, in political positions, has uh, dropped. It's staggeringly low. Um, women represent roughly 6% of Fortune 500 CEOs, and that's an all-time high, 6%. It's hard, I think, to pinpoint why and how gender influences hiring and promotion decisions. You know, some people argue that it's women themselves because we have we choose family or we choose not to commit, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week to our jobs. So it's women who make the choice not to move up. Um, some uh, people think that women simply don't aspire to leadership positions, or at least they don't think they aspire to leadership positions. There was a study done recently <clears throat> commissioned by the Rockefeller Foundation, um, and it was of 50-some women who have either recently led or are leading major successful uh, public and private corporations in the United States. And um, the study found one of the surprising results was that only 12% of these women, and these are women who had made it to the top, um, had early aspirations of leading a company. Two-thirds of them never even consider it, uh, considered it a possibility until somebody else brought it up, which I think is sort of astonishing. So the study's author said this. I thought it was great. We all internalize what a leader looks like. Women need to see women in leadership positions to imagine themselves in these roles. You know, there are other reasons um, that people point to that women don't rise um, into leadership positions. You know, overt or implicit bias, discrimination, structures that impede women's progress. 
Um, but whatever the reason, it's a fact that you will go into a working world um, into entry-level positions pretty equally, you know, uh, uh, in terms of pay, in terms of the positions that you get. And yet, by the time you hit middle management, you're going to see a big shift. And that shift is, is that women start uh, draining out of the system for any or all of these reasons that I've just talked about. So it's, it's, like, it's like a funnel. And women, and by the time you get to the top, it's almost exclusively white men. Uh, there are lots of reasons for that. So that's my, you know, I'm being very gloom, gloom and doom here, but uh, Mike and I both know a lot of women who have made it uh, despite uh, these challenges. Um, and, uh, you know, we have Cronkite grads who most recently uh, named editor of USA Today, um, uh, uh, homepage editor of the Washington Post. Um, uh, what's Macy's position? Um, uh, director of social media at for Bu BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed in Los Angeles. Uh, I talked, I had lunch with the Cronkite graduate today who uh, was state press editor when I was working with the state press, and she just was named um, a judge to Maricopa County Superior Court, wow. um, which was pretty cool. So I talked to her and I talked to some of the others about, okay, so uh, how did you do it? You know, what is, uh, what's the secret sauce? So I have my little list, um, which reflects some of what you've already heard, but um, also some new things. Um, most women think that all they have to do is work really, really hard and their work will speak and be really good at their jobs and their work will speak for itself. Um, that's, and, then, and you'll be rewarded because you've done such a good job. Uh, that's maybe true sometimes, mostly it's not true. Um, you have to call attention to your good work in as an unobnoxious way as you possibly can. <laughs> um, you'd be surprised about how many bosses really don't know what it is you do or what your contribution has been, and you have to find ways to let them know. Um, you need to raise your hand. I think Rashida said this, this, you know, when an opportunity comes up and, you know, maybe people don't even see it as an opportunity, but you see that there's an opportunity there, that you're the first one to raise your hand. You have to ask for the good assignments, which we've mentioned. You have to ask for promotions. You have to ask for raises. Um, when I was at the, um, a newspaper, uh, there was a new editor, um, and uh, he was restructuring the newsroom. And um, uh, he sent around a memo saying, okay, here are all the new assistant managing editor positions. And I was metro editor at the time, and my name wasn't on the list, and I thought, why isn't my name on the list? I've been doing a really good job. I've been working really hard. So I went into his office and I asked, why isn't my name on the list? And he said, uh, because you didn't uh, ask for your name to be put on the list. Uh, and I said, well, I'm asking now. I'd like my name to be put on the list. And we had a conversation and I made my pitch about what I could do and what I, and I, and I got the promotion. I was on the list. I think he was waiting for me to come say, I want the job. And I was just like, oh, you know, my, I've done a great job. He'll just notice me and I'll get the promotion without ever having to ask for it. Um, women, and I know I'm generalizing here, but I think it's pretty true. Women are not good at saying no. I'm not good at saying no. Um, but what that means is that you can end up doing work that really doesn't get you anywhere, uh, that doesn't advance your career, that doesn't teach you anything. And I'm not even talking about it. It can be a low-level job that you learn something, and that can be very valuable. Um, you know, there may be some workplaces where being, and I hope Michael Crow doesn't hear this, um, where being the chair of the um, United Way campaign can really help you advance your career. I have not yet seen that workplace. <laughs> and it's almost always women who get that job. 
So I think you need to be strategic about the jobs you take and the jobs or the assignments and the jobs that you go after. You know, um, you want those that are going to teach you something and help you learn and help you make connections, uh, help you get to the next job. But you don't just want any old grunge job that you know, you know, you nobody else wants. Um, I think that all of us, but women especially, have a hard time um, not being liked. Uh, and I think to be a good leader, you have to be willing not to be liked. Um, and I don't mean going around being a jerk, but I don't need to be friends with all of the people I work with, with the exception of those right here, right? Um, and the truth is, is that people prefer working for somebody uh, who they can trust, who's honest with them, who gives them good feedback, who will help them get better much more than they want to work with their best friend. Uh, so respect is important, but you have to be willing to make hard decisions and have hard conversations, and sometimes just plain not being liked, and you have to be okay with that. Right, Marianne, we've had this conversation. You have to stand up for yourself. You know, you're going to run into bullies, and some of them will be sexual harassers. Um, I have had a range of responses in my career to the bullies and the sexual harassers, from just saying, that's not funny, uh, to a crude joke, um, or you know, uh, saying, uh, when you put your hand on my thigh, it makes me feel uncomfortable, and I want you to stop. Uh, uh, when uh, another unnamed newspaper, there was a bully uh, who ran one of the departments and his tactic with women was to like get right in their faces, like get right, like he, like so you would back up and like yell at you. And you know, he did that to me once and I was really angry with myself because I just kept backing up like, whoa. Next time he did it, I just stood, I refused to move an inch. I stood there with him right in my face till he couldn't get any closer. And I just said very calmly, stop yelling at me, stop yelling at me, stop yelling, until he stopped. And he never did it again. I think you have to stand up for yourself. Um, this goes back to some of what Rashida said, which is um, go sit down with the, go sit down at the table, go into the cafeteria and sit down at the table where the men are playing fantasy football. Um, don't question whether you belong. You belong. Um, I think you have to be really resilient. It takes longer for women to get to the top. The study I was telling you about earlier by the Rockefeller Foundation, um, uh, concluded that it takes 30% longer for a woman to get to the helm of a company than a man. You're going to hear no, and you're going to hear it more than once. Uh, the Cronkite graduate who I had lunch with today, who's a judge, said, I mean, it's a huge process to apply to become a judge. And she went through that. She was told no. She went through it a year or two ago, didn't get it, started it all over again and got it the second time around. Um, we've all been rejected. We've all failed. You know, it's not the end of the world. Sometimes millennials are not very good at this resiliency thing. Um, things are not always going to go well. Um, so uh, when they don't go well in the newsroom or the workplace, you know, uh, go to the bathroom and cry. Never, ever cry in the newsroom. And then go back out there and get back to work. <laughs> And don't let it stop you. Um, that's all. Great. Yeah. All right. Mike. All right. I'll just uh, piggyback on with uh, what Kristen and every, everyone else said. But let's pick up with perseverance. So I was asked to look at some of our alumni, female alumni, and what makes them successful. So I'm just looking at traits and characteristics of their success. So picking up um, on what Kristen said, uh, perseverance. So. We have an anchor in this market. Her name's Katie Rammel, and she works for ABC 15. And one time she came to my class and told the whole class the story that she was up in the tri uh, Washington State in the Tri-Cities area, Kennewick, Richland, Pasco, if you're familiar with that. And first job out of school, she was a reporter. She was trying to be an anchor. Her mother was up there visiting her. She had a bad day at work. 
Um, her mother left after the visit and after this bad day of work. Uh, mom was gone and she looked in her cupboard and had hardly anything on the shelves to eat. I don't know if it was ramen, macaroni, cheese, whatever it was, she hardly had any of that. And so she told the class that she jumped in the shower and just bawled her eyes out. And she goes, what did I get myself into? What did I get myself into? Did I make a mistake in choosing this career path? To Katie's credit, she persevered. She stuck with it. And she succeeded. And because of her good work as a TV reporter in this smaller market up in Washington State, somebody saw her in Phoenix. She applied for a job at ABC 15 as a reporter. And um, but based on her reporting skills, I think it was at the time that, that uh, we had a lot of wildfires here. And based on her reporting skills and those live shots for ABC 15, the news director saw that talent and said, we need a reporter on the anchor desk. Let's make Katie the main anchor along with the other anchor. That's how she became the main anchor at Channel 15. So can you imagine after that shower, if she would have just said, I'm going to chuck it all. I quit. No, she persevered. So again, you're going to have some tough days, but just uh, stay with it. And, and that's the success of, of everyone. Uh, let's see. Um, I wrote down some other names. Uh, determination and drive. Uh, I see that all the time with our alumni. And uh, there's a, a person who graduated in 1996. Her name's Marina Nicola. Marina Nicola. And she um, is from Las Vegas. And she, uh, her parents wanted, to go to U, wanted her to go to UNLV, the home uh, school. And she said, no, I want to go to ASU. And this was before all of this, all of the Cronkite School, right? I wanted to go study journalism at Arizona State University. Her parents said, OK, you can go. Uh, but if you go out of state, you have to pay two years of your college, the last two years, we'll pay the first two years. She said, deal. She wanted to go here so badly. So um, she graduated in three years uh, because, again, she knew that she would have to pay for those last two years. So she made it. <laughs> she has that drive and she has that determination. And every summer that she went home to Las Vegas, she worked at the CBS affiliate as a desk uh, assignment desk person. And then she got into management. She became a producer in Los Angeles, right out of school, and um, as a writer. And um, she dabbled in, in um, television management for a little bit. And now she owns her own PR firm in Las Vegas. And she has offices in Austin. And she has an office in uh, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and Austin. So she's done really well. Uh, so again, that determination and drive. Uh, what else? Oh, focus. Uh, our successful uh, female students have focus. So I'm thinking of Sapita Hashmi, <laughs> Hash, I can't pronounce it, Sapita Hashminium. And she graduated in 2015. Now talk about focus. She was in our BAMMC program, which is similar to our 4 plus 1 or 3 plus 1 program now. So she was getting her master's degree along with her, her bachelor's degree. And she had five internships. And now, and she wanted to go into PR. She started out at the very bottom, which is what, an account coordinator, then became an account, junior account executive. Now she's an account executive in, in Seattle with Allison and Partners. So very, very focused. And then um, I have to bring up Adelaida Severson. Adelaida. Uh, Adelaida, she graduated from, uh, with a master's degree in 1995. But when I think of Adelaida, when I was over at Channel 8 in a management position, the PBS affiliate here, um, I used to work with Adelaida when she used to work at a place called Institutional Advancement at ASU. And um, it was like a public affairs department for ASU to get the brand out there. But I used to work with her on major events uh, that Channel 8 televised. And every time I would see Adelaida, she was so professional. She was professional in the way she dressed, professional in her demeanor, and just the way she respected people. And I really appreciated that. So Adelaida, true professional. And um, I wrote down some other things, too, uh, being good listeners, uh, uh, 
uh, let's see, Bailey Mosier. You guys know who Bailey Mosier is? Bailey, yeah, Bailey is a former master's student, and I'll never forget, she came into my office, career services, and um, she says, I'm looking for an internship. I said, well, what are your interests? And she goes, well, I play golf at Old Dominion. I go, oh, okay, what do you want to do? I want to report on sports. I go, have you ever thought of the Golf Channel? And she goes, not really. <laughs> and, and so she got an internship at the Golf Channel one summer, and guess what she's doing now? She's the host of Morning Drive on the Golf Channel. And so, so she listened, she, to her credit, she just did everything uh, that, that she needed to do to succeed here. So we really appreciate um, uh, good listeners. I wrote down, um, oh, intelligence. You know, females are intelligent, right? Well, maybe. I mean, everybody, I mean, my wife reminds me of that every day. And you know what, I believe her, and I, I believe her. I believe her. She, uh, she says females are smarter than men. And like I said, she reminds me every day. I think we're going to end on that with you, Mike. No, yes. No, and, and, no that, that is, I, be, I truly believe that. I truly <laughs> I, believe we, that. I do want to make sure we have time for questions. Are you okay yes. if we? Yeah, no, that's fine. But I'm just saying that, you know, um, intelligence, uh, a stick to uh perseverance, um, and, and professionalism. So. Thank Great. You. So, w did you guys get enough advice? You guys worn out? It's like, oh my gosh. They want ice cream. Yeah. Right. Um, all right. Let's let's move to questions from the audience. Who's going to go first today? One of our loves. Hello. My name is Ivana. Um, I wanted to say first off, thank you for this great advice. Being a woman. Well, I can my full girl, um, growing into womanhood and going into a career specifically in PR, I have been uplifted by a lot of amazing women. My question is specifically for Mr. Wong, but everybody can answer this. I know that we got a lot of advice for women. How do you think that men can be allies for us going into a field that is, you know, slightly dominated by men? I think it all has to do with respect, respecting knowledge, intelligence, talent, and seeing it. Uh, but as the panelists uh, described earlier, you got to let it be known too. You know, um, you, you, we can't read your minds, that type of thing. So let it be known. Take, get that seat at the table, uh, and I think it all has to do with respect. And uh, as as men respect women, and vice versa, I think you know the workplace will be much better. I'm sure they can chime in. Rashido, what would you add to that? What do you the want only to other thing I would add is is just tr treat women who are peers as your peers. We don't need anything special. Just give us the same considerations and courtesy and um, partnership that you would um, any male in my, in, in my position. And I think at minimum, if, if we get that, we're able to perform and succeed on levels uh, that either mirror or exceed where, where the men in, in our um, professional lives are, are performing. So I, I think, you know, it really goes similar to what you said with respect. Just treat us as peers. We don't need, we don't need anything more or less um, from a from a peer-to-peer -peer standpoint. And then I think the other part of it is, is just support and advocacy. You know, especially if you work in an environment or an industry where you see or know that there are um, inequalities or disparities between you and women who are your peers, it it, the onus is on you, you know, we, you say when you go through the airport, see something, say something, whether it's being a, as vocal and forward um, to your organization or just being a supporter to that woman, you know, the responsibility is on all of us. Great. Okay, next question. Lindsay. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for the um, wonderful advice. I I noticed that a common theme was confidence, both um, personally and professionally at the table. And I wanted to know that what are some ways that the, um, you all uh, cultivate that confidence, you know, both personally and professionally? Sometimes you just have to pretend. <laughs> okay. oh. <laughs> I would say put yourself in situations that challenge you. I mean, start with maybe smaller opportunities, but put yourself in situations that challenge you to 
um, go out of your comfort zone and build that confidence, um, whether that's coming up and asking a question like you are right now or other opportunities that when you walk away, it gives you a little bit of that boost and that confidence and make you feel good. Um, and it also comes from within, you know, as well, you know, looking in the mirror without getting too kind of goofy, but, you know, looking in the mirror and, and knowing that you are great and wonderful and um, you don't need validation from anyone else and just go out there and be the best that you can and, and know that that's going to be rewarded. I actually have a book that I would suggest to you guys. Um, it's called You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. <laughs> it is hilarious. But it is such a great book for this very reason because um, it will, it, it's that little voice in your head that says, no, why are you going to do that to yourself? Why are you going to put yourself out there like that? Um, and I think everybody on this panel will say to you that it continues. I mean, even now, every, I mean, new, new experiences that are a little frightening, you're just like, all right, I can do this. And then when you do it, then that's when you take out the wine. I mean, it's great, you know? So anyway, but Jen Sincero, you are a badass. It's a good book. I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> I just add one more thing to that. And it's something that I use even today. I'm a big believer in rip the bandaid off. The moment you start feeling anxious or insecure about something, push yourself to do it. And a lot of times you feel even better on the other side of it because it's like, wow, I actually got that done. Like, I didn't think I could do it. And instead of spending 10, 15, 30 minutes talking yourself out of it, rip the bandaid off, push yourself to do it. Whether it's making a comment, raising your hand, you know, whatever it is, it, at the end of the day, you know, and I'll, the other thing is, what's the worst that can happen? You say something goofy in a meeting. You say something kind of off base. You say something other people don't agree with. Who cares? No one will remember this after that moment. So there's no harm, no foul. And the more you rip the bandit off, the more comfortable you feel doing it, doing it for the big things. That's great. Great. So Dean Gilger, you mentioned drawing attention to your work in a way that doesn't come off as showboaty. What advice do you and the rest of the panel have so that we can do that and make sure that we get the recognition that we're looking for, for the work that we do? Um, I, I have a couple of suggestions. One is, and I cannot tell you how many times this has happened to me, where it, it, I've been in a meeting and I'll say something or suggest something, I have an idea, and the conversation just keeps going. And then somebody else, a man, will say the same thing and everybody will pay attention. Go oh. That's a good idea. And uh -huh. what I finally learned to do is to say, yes, it is, and it was mine. <laughs> good. <laughs> um, another thing you can do, I, I think it's, it's actually been documented in studies that bosses really don't know what you do. Um, and so sometimes that can be, I forget what it's called, it's like a, 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 a one minute, uh, I forget what it's called. There's a name for it where you do a real quick written, here's what I here's what I did this week, here are the things I still, you know, are on my plate and here are my aspirations, long term aspirations. It's like a one pager that you can either, depending upon how your boss likes to be communicated with, it could be an email, it could be a quick meeting each week. But you need to like in a nice way keep telling them that this is and not all just bragging, but you know, what you're working on and what the challenges are that you're facing. So that you know they really do know what your contribution is. And this is yeah. where um, I think uh, Karen said, you know, find a mentor uh, within the workplace, maybe here at school, and and bounce those ideas, your your work samples off someone. Let somebody see it, like Dean Gilger, you know, like one of the professors. And and then when when you produce that quality work, enter it into various competitions and get recognized for it. And then all of a sudden you're being recognized at the local, regional, national level. Um, and then people start knowing about all the great work that you're doing and producing. So I want to add one other thing to this, and that is that I think increasingly workplaces are becoming less hierarchical. And so what that means is just sort of making sure your boss knows something is not enough. That ideally it is having your peers know about it, you know, other people in the organization, because then when they say to your boss or the people who are in a decision-making ability, oh, you know, I just saw this happen that she did, isn't that great? It means so much more. And so um, I just, I think that 
that used to be less true, but I think increasingly that's become a way to sort of get noticed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Hi, everyone. Um, so as we all know, this industry is a 24-7 news cycle. Yes. And, <laughs> you know, you all were talking about how you have to pull the uh, late night shifts or wake up really early and get into the newsroom. And I'm just curious for us women who really want to have a family one day, we want to have kids, how do you find that balance? All right, and I have to no answer, answer this one. No, I get to Everyone answer this one. <laughs> like, how do you... <laughs> <laughs> how do you do it? That's the thing I'm most worried about if I do go into this industry is trying to figure out how to have a family, but also still be like a CEO one day or a boss. Can I, can I, I just want to, I just, I have to tell you this. So I yeah. go with this thought and it's, you can do it all and you can do it all well, but you cannot do it all perfectly. And that's what you're going to have to live with. And it's okay. Some days it's going to be perfect. Other days it's going to be in the toilet. And it doesn't matter whether that's the way your kids are dressed or that's the way the story is going to be edited. It's just like that. So, um, and, and I, so one of my experiences um, when I was at the Journal, um, before I became executive editor, we all had to take turns working one of the three major holidays for us, which was Christmas, Christmas Eve, and Thanksgiving. Um, and so I always chose Christmas. Christmas Eve because I could get out at nine o'clock, but my parents' house was, you know, a half an hour away, so I could get out at nine o'clock, but I was, so, and my, my mother would not let my children or my, my nieces open presents till I got there. So I would like peel around the corner on two wheels, you know, driving like a million miles an hour to get to Christmas Eve for 9.30. And my niece's faces would be against the dining room window, which is waiting for me, like waiting for me. And I always felt so terrible about it, but there was nothing I can do. My mother had her show and, and I had to stay until at least nine o'clock. And so that's, you just do what you have to do. But then I got to spend Christmas and Thanksgiving with my family. So anyway, there's, trade-offs. I have a facetious answer and a not facetious answer. So the facetious answer is, is um, uh, what worked really well for me was my husband stayed home and raised our kids. Uh, that worked great. Um, and he was actually better at it than me, uh, than I would have been. They'd all be in psychiatric care if, if I had been the one to stay home with them. So it worked out really well. They all turned out great. Um, but the sort of non-facetious answer, I asked this question uh, right when I was pregnant with my first child of my mentor, who was an associate dean at the University of Nebraska. And I said, well, you know, I don't know if I want to take this job at the Times Picayune in New Orleans because I'm going to have this baby and yada, yada, yada. And she said to me, and her husband, she had raised two children all by herself. Her husband had died very young. Mm -hmm. And she said to me something I've never forgotten. She said, you don't have to be there all the time. You just have to be there at the important times. Mm -hmm. I would say it depends on your journey to reflect on what Mike said with regards to Katie Remmel, who happens to be a good friend of mine. She is um, about my age, which is early 40s, and she just started her family. So she was on a career path, and I know it was important to her to find someone in her life and to have a family, but I also know that deep down, being an anchor and being successful and building her career was important to her as well. So um, it, it wasn't the right time and it wasn't the right place for her in those 20s and 30s. It wasn't until later and now she has three beautiful children and a great man in her life and is still thriving in her career. But maybe it was that she did have to make some sacrifices you know that were maybe not her first choice and maybe she's a better mom now and a better you know i can't speak for her but um so it also just depends on your journey and the path that you're on um on the broadcast side i mean you're moving to different cities like rashida said i mean you're move, you, you know it's yeah. hard to find some of that stability um, a lot of the on-air people are very close friends of mine. One came here and her boyfriend came down here to be in this market. He was part-time, then he got a full-time one in Denver, so now she's up in Denver. I mean, it, it's kind of a, a dance, um, but I think you have to focus on what's important to you and, you know, you can't do it all perfectly all the time. I totally agree with that, but also what, what is that, that path? I'm not a good one to give any reference or example to, um, just because I'm like 90% work and 10% my personal life, which the balance is important though. Yeah. 
Yeah. Rashida, I'll add just you? one quick thing to that, just if you don't mind, just because I've I've also done that and also had to decide how and when. I've got two kids, and um, I think the biggest thing for them is uh, I will be there for the important things. I'm, I can't be there for everything. If you guys had any idea what I was doing in the, up until 60 seconds before the, the chat, it was bath time and is your homework done and do you have lunch money tomorrow and I've got this thing I've got to do at 10 o'clock Eastern and we just got home from basketball practice 20 minutes ago so it's like you just have to juggle it and 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 my kids get to grow up in like this cool world where they know how they knew early in life how green screens work they understand when breaking news happens how it all plays out and it's like the trade-off for a normal life so to speak is they've got access to this incredible world of news and journalism and and when they see something break they know they not only know what the news is but how it how it works and and what it means when the president has a news conference you know what i mean so it's like you get the trade off also of just this really cool experience that you know children no offense to bankers and you know normal job parents but that normal job parents don't get so there's there's some kind of comfort in that too my kids grew up in newsrooms and they remember it really fondly, like writing headlines in the middle of our stories. I'd get the phone call and they'd help me write headlines for the front page. <laughs> One of them's now a journalist. It worked. Thank, Great. Thank, so thank you. All right. Thank you all for attending the session and the other sessions. If you're interested in the issue of gender in the workplace, I'll be teaching an online class on the topic in fall semester B. It's offered as a, both a JMC and MCO class. And so now let's adjourn for ice cream and conversation. And thank you, Rashida, so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>